complete. And we'll talk about the objectivity results and also about the inversion formulas for the circular auto transform. So let me remind you uh, what we are doing. We have this transform that takes a function. Uh, you can, if you want, you can think about the function on defined on the plane, the two-dimensional version, but some of the results would be for Rn. Again, in applications, uh, the meaningful ones are 2D and 3D. But uh, for pure mathematical reasons, if you want, you can even think of the same problem uh, for a function defined in Rn. So uh, we have a function, and we are trying to recover it to that function from its integrals along circles on the plane, or spheres, hyperspheres, depending on the dimension that you are considering. And as we said before, there are uh, too many dimensions in the data. So if you think of the plane, for example, the family of circles has three dimensions, and you're trying to recover a two-dimensional function. So you can match the dimensions in many ways. And there are some examples written here. But the most meaningful one is if you limit the centers of the integration circles to a curve, or if you're talking about spheres to a hypersurface, hyperspheres uh, with centers on a hypersurface. And uh, we said that there are some obvious easy counterexamples when you cannot recover uniquely. If you have a function that is odd with respect to a line or a hyperplane, then you cannot recover. And then we wanted to distinguish between the good sets and the bad sets. And so the good sets, the so-called objectivity sets, are the sets that if you're sitting on that set and you're listening for a certain period of time to the signals coming, then if you didn't hear anything, that means there was nothing to start with. So if the integrals are all zero, that implies that the function was identically zero. In that case, we say that the set on which you're sitting at the time that you allow to listen to the signals is an injectivity set. And one can also formulate an absolutely similar idea for the elliptical transform. I won't be talking about the elliptical transform today, but tomorrow I'll be talking about that. So the definition for injectivity sets would be very much the same. And uh, I'm going to formulate a couple of results that are uh, classical in the field that, you know, that have been around for about 20 years. But for that, I need to do some preparation. So uh, let's do some simple notations and, and observe some properties. So first of all, for a given function f, now pay attention, I am everything between the next two, three slides is in Rn. Again, if you are more comfortable, you can think of R2, but this thing holds in Rn. Uh, continuous functions with a compact support in R. So S with bracket F is the set of all points such that the, you are sitting at that point and uh, all the integrals along circles at any radius are zero. Okay, so, so this is the point. You are, you're sitting here, you measure the integrals of your function along concentric circles with the center here, and all of those integrals are zero for all R. Now it is obvious that this set SF may not be non-empty for any function. For this, for this set to be non-empty, for example, if the function is a function of two variables, at least your, the, the integral of the function along the plane should be zero. Right? Your function should have, if you integrate your function along the whole plane, the integral should be zero. Why? Because you can do a polar integration, integrate along circles and then along the radius, and if all the integrals along circles are zero, the integral over the plane is zero. So if your, if your function is such that the integral over the whole plane is not zero, this set, set is empty. And so I'm assuming that I have a function for which this set is not empty, but it's empty, then the rest is trivial. There is not, nothing to tell so about. RF is the spherical. Uh, RF is the spherical Aron transform centered. centered at x at radius r. Okay, so, uh, so again, if, uh, let's say for some easy examples, let's say you have this. Right? If you're sitting, uh, if your function is 1 here and minus 1 here, you're sitting here, this is x, right? So then you measure the integrals along all possible radii, you get zero, right? And then you move, this is x1, you move to another x2, you have the same thing. So for this function, s of f would be this line, right? Because you're sitting there and all the integrals are zero. If your function is, uh, say, identically one, then your s of f is empty. So in order for s of f not to be empty, you have to have this property that uh, it's a necessary condition, right? It's not sufficient, but it's necessary that the integral over the whole plane is zero. Uh, well, this is not a good example. It's not compactly supported, but okay. So, so I'm still this So, what's the significance of this? Uh, you will see it in a minute. Okay, all right. Uh, I, I, you know, let, let's follow on that. You'll see the significance of this in a second. Uh, 
And, and there are a couple of other definitions that seem arbitrary at the beginning, but on the next page you'll see the, the, the essence of it. Okay, so um, here's another notation. This QK is a convolution of my function with uh, R to the degree 2K, or here's a more a nicer definition. So what I mean by convolution, this is the polar radius. So what you do is you take your function, you measure the distance from X to C and you take to the degree 2K and take this integral. So this is the definition of QK. R squared is defined like you would think it is. And uh, it is very easy to see that it's a polynomial in X of degree 2K. Just differentiate that many times you get to zero. It's a polynomial in X. Okay, and one more notation. V bracket QK is the set of all zeros of QKs. Okay, so QKs are these polynomials. V of QK is the set of zeros of those polynomials. Okay, so why these things are essential will be clear in a second. Now, uh, first of all, uh, a couple of... Can you write the definition here on the side? So ah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Otherwise, we'll miss it. So, S L is the set of X such that uh, R F X R is 0 for any R. Uh, and then two k two k x as this integral uh, x minus c to the degree two k right uh, f of c d c and d of two k is the zero set so this is the all the sets, all the x's for which two k of x is equal to zero. Okay. So it is so some simple observations. So first of all, we're saying that any non-injectivity set of the spherical transform R has to be a subset of S of f for some f not equal to zero. So let me repeat this. So no, what is a non-injectivity set? Non-injectivity set means that you are sitting at those points. You are measuring all the integrals. They are zero, but your function was not zero. That means that it has to be a subset of S of f for that non-zero f that you are not observing by looking at the integral. Right, so if you have a non-injectivity set for your Radon transform, that non-injectivity set has to be a subset of S of f for some f. Right? Okay. So, so again, let, let's see. What is a non-injectivity set? So, uh, let's say S is non-injectivity set. Non-injectivity set for R. What this thing means is that uh, there exists some point, or, I mean, for F, in fact, for every point, uh, R F of X R is equal to zero for any R Yet, f is not identically zero. That what means that that, that is exactly what the non-injectivity is. But then, on the other hand, well, this thing but there is some f. For this there point. exists some f. If, if you have a non-injectivity non set, then there has to be some f for which uh, it, it is a subset of uh, that, you know, that non-injectivity set is a subset of that x. Okay. So hence, it is important to describe the geometries of this kind of things of this kind of s of f's. Because that's my goal. My big goal right now is basically to classify all possible sets as good ones and bad ones. Okay. And for the next 20 minutes to half an hour, I'm assuming that I have all the radii available. So when I was talking about injectivity sets, I was saying that you may also have limitations in your radius. For right now, I'm assuming that I have all the radii. I'm only talking about the locations of the centers. Okay, so a couple of lemmas. Lemma number one says that if you have a compactly supported continuous function, then S of f is an intersection of all VQ case. Okay, Q case are this, uh, the VQ case are the zeros of this polynomials. And we're saying that Q k depends on f. It's not written here, but it depends on f. So S of f is an intersection of all Q case of f. Okay, so why is this true? 
Uh, let's see. So the proof is not uh, it's, it's really short in the, in the short form, but let's 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 discuss it. So first of all, uh, we say that the condition that r f of x r is equal to zero for all r is equivalent to the fact that this integral is zero for any compactly supported continuous function. So let's let, let's think about this equivalent. If one direction is easy, the other direction not so much, but it's not too hard either. If the Radon transforms, circular Radon transforms, are zero for all r, that means I'm trying to go from here to here. Again, this is a continuous function that depends basically only on the distance. Okay. So if the Radon transforms are all zero, you can write this integral over r n in polar coordinates, right? And then take this guy out. Inside you have only the integrals along hyperspheres. That's zero. Hence this thing is zero. So going from this direction to this direction is fairly straightforward. Going from this direction to the other direction is also fairly easy if you consider delta-like sequences, uh, uh, continuous, uh, delta-like that would go when uh, uh, you basically, this is like, think of Rn, right? You can get delta-like continuous functions that would uh, transform this to the integrals only along circles. Your delta would be kind of concentrating towards the circles. So I'm penetrating, but basically that's the way you would do it. So these two properties are equivalent. So uh, this is zero for all r is the same thing as this integral is zero for all compactly supported continuous functions depending only on the distance. Now that means that this thing is basically the set of this is equivalent to set of all x's for which this is true. Now I just want to see that the set of x's for which this is true is equal to this. Uh, well, if you have this statement true for any continuous function, you clearly have that for polynomials. So one direction is easy, and the other direction is following from the density of polynomials in the space of continuous functions by Weierstrass is here. Okay. So, but you are considering an even degree polynomial, right? In the definition of PQ. That's true, but uh, let's see. Uh, so that is alpha is a function. Yeah, you have a continuous function, so you can you can take care of it, right? Because uh, oh, it's correct. So it's correct. In the definition of VQ, in the previous, here you have two K, right? VKs are with two Ks. Two Ks have two K here, and then if you look here, up is also with square here. So you have a square here, and you have a square in the definition of VKs. Okay, so so then then I'll be using this fact in a second. Uh, this is this is important. Again, remember my goal is to describe all the sets as good and bad, and it turns out that this is what I want to describe. I want to describe these sets, and it turns out that these sets are basically dependent on these sets. Okay, it's a little bit long, but you'll see why uh, right now. So now assume I have a compactly supported continuous function. Then if f, then f is identically zero, if and only if uh, uh, Qk of f is zero for all k. In other words, all these polynomials are identically zero. So, if your if your function is identically zero, it is clear that these guys are zero, right? They are defined with f. If f is zero, all the polynomials are zero. Now, on the other hand, if all of your polynomials are zero, right? Uh, then, if all of these guys are zero, then s of then the spherical integrals are zero for every x, right? Because v of qk is everything, and then s of f is everything, and you're saying that regardless of where you sit, all spherical integrals of your function, of all the radii with all the centers are zero, that means your function is identically zero. So what does that mean? That means that if f is not zero, then there has to be at least one polynomial which is not zero, identically, right? Because if all of them are zero, your f is identically zero. So if f is not, then there has to be at least one polynomial, which is not zero. Let me call k min the index, the smallest index of the non-trivial polynomial. The statement says that that polynomial is harmonic. The, the, the polynomial with the smallest index that is non-trivial has to be harmonic. The first part was what I was saying, the first sentence. The second part is very easy. You can simply directly compute the Laplacian just by hand. And you will see that the Laplacian of 2k is equal to this. Well, if this is the smallest non-trivial one, 
That means that is trivial. That means the right hand side is identically zero, the Laplacian is zero, so 2k is harmonic. So the smallest guy is harmonic. And what does this tell us? This tells us that if R is not injected on some set, then that set is a subset of the zero set of harmonic polynomials. I use the word set too much, but again, the bad sets, the non-injectivity sets, are contained in zero sets of harmonic polynomials. This result was known in early 90s. It's due to uh, Vladimir Lin and Naum Zobin. It's interesting that uh, Vladimir Lin was thinking of this problem. He is not in inverse problems. He's a guy who does approximation theory. And the reason he was thinking about this problem was that it is equivalent to a problem from approximation theory that can be stated as follows. For a second, forget about this. I'll come back to this. I just want to show you that you can reformulate the same thing in so many different areas of mathematics. So imagine that you're trying to approximate a continuous function defined on the plane by radial functions. Radial functions are the ones that depend only on the plane by the distance from a certain fixed point. So it doesn't vary with x1 and x2. You, you choose a point, and that your function depends only on the distance from that point. So there is a question. You consider the class of all compactly supported continuous functions on the plane. What is the limitation of the, of the centers on the of points on the plane, such that if you consider radial functions with centers at those points, that will be a complete set. You can approximate the continuous ones by the radial ones with that kind of centers. Could this function go on the finite on the positive domain or RN? No, no, continuous on the whole RN. Yeah. And it turns out it's not too 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 long to prove. It's, it's in the Aronofsky Quinto paper, for example, where you can see that these two problems are equivalent. The set of locations for the centers of the radial functions that allow you to get a dense set in the space of continuous functions on the space is equivalent to the uh, uh, non injectivity sets. So the bad sets there, the bad sets that don't allow you to uniquely approximate and so on, are the bad sets here. So these guys were thinking of the approximation theory of problem, and they came up with this idea that, okay, if it's a bad set, it has to be in the zero set of a harmonic polynomial. And then it was shown that it is also equivalent to this thing. So what this means is that in everything that follows, you can keep in mind that if you have a set that is not a zero set of a harmonic polynomial, that's immediately a good set. If you have something that is larger than a zero set of a harmonic polynomial, you're in good shape. It's probably very hard to check whether the set is. Uh, exactly. So and that's that's going to uh, you know complicate things. It, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that. But basically, in two D, the zero sets of a harmonic polynomials are pretty well studied. In higher spaces, it's it's a nightmare, and that's why. Well, that's one of the reasons why the Adrianowski and, and Quinto result is not easily uh, generalizable to uh, the higher dimensions. So I'm going to state that famous result that I've talked about already so much. Uh, but to state the result, I need one more definition. So a Coxeter says set of lines, a Coxeter system of n lines, is a cross of n lines. By cross, I mean they all pass through the same point. You can think of this being origin, for example. And the angle of intersection is the same. So a Coxeter set of two lines is a perfect cross. Coxeter set system of three lines is a so. So and this is just a, 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 a notation uh, in, in uh, identifying the complex plane with the R2. Okay? But you don't have to think of complex plane. Just think of uh, n lines intersecting at the same point with equal angle. That's what a Coxeter system of n lines is. So here's that result. It was proved in 1996, or it was published in 96, maybe proved a little earlier, that said that a set S in R2, again, by the way, guys, everything up to here was in Rn. Up to here, everything was true in Rn. Now this result is in R2, and it is also for a very special uh, class of functions, compactly supported functions. So if you are in R2, and you have a non-injectivity set, so it's a bad set, that set has to be contained in something like this. A Coxeter set moved around, or maybe it's a rigid motion, so you're allowed to rotate and shift around, union with a finite set. So basically, bad sets are like this. A cross under any rotation anywhere on the plane 
plus some points. You can add as many points as you want, finitely many, and across like this. The, in that case, there exists a function, there exists an f defining the plane, where such that the integrals with centers on this set, coxeter set plus finitely many points would give you zero, but the function is not zero. And the other way around, anything that does not fit in something like this is immediately an injectivity set. So you take a piece of parabola, no matter how small, that's immediately an injectivity set. So if you're sitting on a small piece of parabola and you have all the integrals of all the radii with centers on this small piece of the parabola, that is enough to uniquely recover your function, assuming your function is compactly supported. Hyperbola, circle, you, you name it. If it's slightly curved, and then and if, it's, if it's one dimensional, it's not of dimension zero, then, then, then you're in good shape. And even if there are two vertices, like there are two lines, three lines. Exactly. And so if you have, for example, uh, something like a triangle, you're good. In fact, I'll be talking about something more general than this, but. And one thing I wanted to notice, probably I'll get to this type of problems tomorrow, but I want you again to keep in mind that everything that is said here is under the assumption that I have all the radii. You limit your radii, the game changes. Now, there is a conjecture in the same paper in 1996 about the complete description of good and bad sets in higher dimensions. And the conjecture says the following, that it, for, for a set to be an injectivity set, it is enough for that set not to be contained in something exactly like this, omega of sigma union f, where sigma, which is the higher dimension brother of Proxeter set, is the zero set of a homogeneous harmonic polynomial, and f, which used to be finitely many points in higher dimensions, is an algebraic subset in Rn of co-dimension at least two. So let me step back and, and, and go into a little bit more details. The Coxeter set is substituted by a zero set of a homogeneous harmonic polynomial. The fact that it has to be a harmonic polynomial we already discussed. The key thing here is homogeneous. And it's not surprising if you think of the Coxeter set here, homogeneity forces all of them to go to the origin. Right? And then the rigid motion allows you to move it around. But they all have to go through the same point. So at least this agrees I mean, with the previous one. And what used to be finitely many points is the algebraic variety of co-dimension at least two. So if you're in R3, a co-dimension at least two would be like uh, curves in R3 and points in R3. If you go to higher dimensions, you can add anything of dimension by two less or more or less. But the interesting part again is that it has to be algebraic. This is also very, very important and brings this brings a lot of different fields of mathematics. Algebraic geometry clearly comes because this is geometric and you have algebraic sets and so on and as soon as you start talking about algebraic geometry uh, the field immediately becomes large and hard. Um, let me talk a little bit about the proof. The, the, the conjecture is still not proved. It has been almost what, 20 years, 18 years. So if you're looking for a problem that would make you famous here. So why the conjecture in higher dimensions is not proved completely? There are two key techniques that are used in the proof of the two-dimensional case. The first thing is they are using microlocal analysis to the integral operator techniques, which is used, there are some, some part of the proof which is used at the edge of the support. They do this reflection with respect to the edge of the support running something to infinity and something happens. If you don't have edge of the support, then the whole argument falls apart. So a lot of people, and almost everybody in this field, believes that both in 2D and in higher dimensions, the result would hold if you allow fast decay, say exponential decay, exponential decay without requiring compact support. But it is not clear how to prove the full strength of the result if, if you don't have the edge of the support. This proof doesn't work for that. So the generalizations, although the previous general generalization was for uh, compactly supported in Rn, even in R2, if you give up compact support but keep as fast of a decay as you want, it's still not clear. 
the full strength of the result is not here. There are partial results which I'll be talking about. The other thing is that, the, as we already said, the, the proof substantially uses the, the, the knowledge of the geometry of the zero sets of harmonic polynomials. In 2D, it's very well studied. In 3D and so on, things become very hard very quickly, and they're not that well known. Although there are certain interesting things that uh, one can get, and hopefully I can, I can talk about that today. So this restricts the possibility of generalizing the results to plastically decaying but non-compactly supported functions. By the way, guys, I, you know, of course, everybody may be thinking, uh, what are you talking about? All the patients are compactly supported, no matter how uh, overweight they are. But uh, as I said, a lot of this has applications in different other fields of math, and it's interesting just for, for the, its own sake as a math problem. So this part is not about applications. This is a mathematical problem. Uh, that this part going to higher dimensions is at least important in applications for the 3D. In a more uh, higher dimensions, it's, it's, it's interesting in its own right. Plus, also, it's interesting if you can do something in uh, Riemannian manifolds, say in hyperbolic plane and so on. Again, very little is done there. So, what about short space? No, as I said, you give up, you give up compact support. Uh, well, I don't want to say nothing is normal. I'll show you plenty of results today, lots of results, where you don't have to have compact support. When I say it's not known, you don't have conditions that are simultaneously necessary and sufficient. Okay, there are plenty of results one way or the other. Or if you have this, then it's definitely good, and you don't have compact support. Or if you have this, it's definitely bad, and you don't have to require compact support. But if you want these things to match, to be simultaneously necessary and sufficient, like in other Oski Quinter result, that is not done. Perfect. So you need zero sets of harmonic polynomials or homogeneous polynomials? Uh, so the, 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 the homogeneous polynomials, uh, sorry, the harmonic polynomials we already know at the beginning that those little lemmas that I showed. Uh, but that's not enough. The, 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 everybody believes it has to be homogeneous, and that homogeneous part is something not so not so easy to prove. I see. But those, those are the zero sets of homogeneous harmonic polynomials known in high dimension. Not no. very well studied, no. So, in, in, so, so, for example, I'll show you today a result where uh, basically in 3D that means that you have to have a cone, That's, you know, like a, something like this. For it to be a non intensive uh, yes, and what we are able to prove under certain conditions that it's a ruled surface. In other words, it's a surface made out of lines, which this is clearly made out of lines, but saddles, some hyperboloids and so on, are also made out of lines. The problem, the difference between a hyperboloid and this is that these guys are all passing through one point, the homogeneity condition, whereas the hyperboloid doesn't. So, and it's not so easy to see how can we force it not to be a saddle, but to be a cone. So that, that's essential. Okay, and so because of all these limitations, uh, there is a need in other approaches, other mathematical techniques that would allow to attack the problem. Even if you try to reprove uh, the same result as Agronovsky and Quinto got, but with other means, that may be good because then your technique may be generalizable, whereas theirs wasn't. So one. Uh, possible area of well, one possible technique to approach is the PDE approach. And here is the, the connection. Again, there is a lot of uh, work done here. And, uh, Professor Rakesh has done some excellent work, and probably he will be talking about that. And I'll be definitely talking about some of their work today. Uh, the PDE approach is the following you consider a wave equation. Again, if you want, think of R2. Okay, so you have a membrane that is oscillating. And then you have this uh, initial condition, so the membrane at moment, moment zero was addressed, and then you hit it with a hammer, and then you were looking, you know, how the membrane oscillates. Uh, the solution of this thing is very well known, even in Kuro and Hilbert's book, you can get this formula. Uh, the formula of the solution of the wave equation with this initial conditions. Now, what is important here, guys, is, again, depending on x and t, if you look right here, inside I have RFXR, and this RFXR is exactly the circular Radon transform centered at point x of radius r. Okay, so if if you know if, if this is what you have, what you want is f. So an f is clearly related to u. 
look what my problem of inverting the Radon transform ends up being. I want F, which is I want the uh, UT on the plane, if you think of the vertical one being the time. So I want to recover U from F, but if, if what you have is RF only on the boundary point, only at some points, you see, I mean, what I'm saying is not making much sense already. So, uh, let's say, let's say you are, this is at the plane, you are observing this is S, and you are observing the Radon transform uh, at some points along this surface area, right? So, uh, F is defined in the plane of the board, and you are you are measuring its integrals at this point. Now, you want to, if you think of the wave equation, what if you have if you have x only for uh, rf only for x that belongs to s? What that means is that if you think of the now this is a different picture. If you think of the this being the time. Uh, no, sorry, no, this is not time, this is u. This is x1, this is x2, and this is s. So your, your membrane is oscillating with time. This is u and time is not here, right? So the, the membrane is in this, at, at the beginning is at rest and then it starts moving. So you, you are allowed to measure how your membrane oscillates along this curve for all the time. So you have a drum, you hit that drum, and you're allowed to see what happens to that drum along a certain curve, only along that curve, but for the whole time. You can sit there and, and look at what happens along that curve for all the time. Then can you recover from that information basically the shape of the hammer with which you hit it originally? Right? So you have this for only x belongs to s, and from that you want to recover u at moment zero. Sorry, ut at moment zero. So it's Remember I said that one can reformulate the same problem in terms of approximation theory. This is the reformulation of the problem in terms of PDUs. And then one can try to use all the techniques of hyperbolic equations uh, to, to get something useful out of it. And there are various nice results. So the first one, uh, which was done in 1996 by Agarovsky, Bernstein, and Kuchman, uh, says the following thing, that uh, basically if U is a bounded domain and S is the boundary, then it is a uniqueness, it's a set of injectivity, and it, uh, for compactly supported functions for sure. In fact, they, they do it for LQ functions, and they tell you the threshold value of Q. How fast should the function decay if you want to have uniqueness? So let me explain geometrically what that means. If you have, you, if, you're, if S is a closed curve, okay? So it's a boundary of some domain. And this is the example with the triangle that we just discussed, like for example, this. This is an injective, this is an injectivity set, this is an injectivity set. Any closed curve is an injectivity set for all compactly supported functions. Moreover, any closed curve is an injectivity set for functions that decay sufficiently fast. And the sufficiently fast is given by this value. N is the dimension. So if Q is less or equal than this, then you have uniqueness. If it's bigger than this, you're in trouble. One can compute the counterexample, build the counterexample. Okay, and then and this is basically coming from PDE approach because if you if you observe your membrane along a closed curve, you can uniquely recover the, that shape of the hammer. They, they use the PDE techniques to do it. And this is this, for example, that is answering your question is nothing known for functions that decay fast. Well, here is the result that is no longer functions decaying sufficiently fast. In fact, they have an accurate threshold value. But clearly this is for, for, you know, for the, the set to be closed set is a sufficient condition for it being injected, but it's definitely not a necessary condition. Right? Every closed curve is for a sufficiently fast decaying functions an injectivity set, but you don't have to have it if, you, if you're just looking for an injectivity set. Okay, I want to stop here, guys. Saying it? Well, it, it's in the analysis, but basically that tells you, uh, that, you know, it, it, how fast the function decays. If it doesn't decay 
very fast than one can compute the counter example. So I, you know, it's, a, it's in the analysis, but you know, I, I, when I said I want to stop here, I don't mean to stop the lecture. I want to, <laughs> I want to give you opportunity to ask questions before I move forward because. So oh, this is true for any bounded domain, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It has the, the bounded domain. That's why I'm saying the curve is a closed curve. It's a bounded domain, and S is the boundary of the domain. That the function is not compactly supported. But I'm trying to describe the set of which I'm trying to judge if it's an injectivity set or not. If that set is the boundary of that bounded domain, then uh, it has to be an injectivity set. If the class of functions you consider is the class of functions that decay sufficiently fast. Suppose this unbounded domain, and I'm taking some portion of uh, boundary, then. Yeah, yeah, so this result doesn't address that, but that does not mean that there are no results. I will be talking later about situations when uh, your curve is uh, part of an unbounded uh, algebraic uh, variety. There are results like this. This one does not address that, but there are results like this. And uh, by the way, guys, what this thing means, clearly, you know, if your function is compactly supported, you're immediately in good shape. And what this thing means is that, for example, from the point of view of medical imaging, this is it, you can stop your research right there, right? So if you place uh, the detectors along any closed curve, whether the patient's cross-sections boundary is ellipse, a circle, a square, or anything irregular, as long as it's uh, a closed curve, you're in good shape, right? Everything else that we discuss is more or less now pure mathematical uh, interest. This result uh, cannot be applied by other methods? Um, I I don't know. I mean, the, the result with the sufficiently fast decay, all the results I have seen about non compactly supported things with decay uh, use uh, wave equation one way or another. Or maybe the Arbu equation, but PDE approach. You need to be smooth, at least. Uh, by you, you mean the, by you, you mean the, uh, the, the bond. No, it doesn't have to be. As I said, like even triangle or rectangle, or it doesn't have to be small. As long as it's closed, it's okay. Okay, so, and this is in our end, right? So any dimensions that you don't have compact support. So this is the result from the 2004 paper of uh, David Finch, uh, Professor Rakesh, and Sarah Tak. There are uh, very there are several very uh, uh, nice results there. Uh, this is the first one, and I'll be referring to, to some others later. This is about the injectivity. The paper had also some results about inversion formulas. So here's what the, what the result says. If you have a bounded domain, and you have uh, uh, a piece of its boundary, oh, the, and the domain has to be strictly, uh, it, it has to have a strictly uh, convex, uh, smooth boundary. If you take any uh, relatively open subset, any small piece of the boundary, then if you're assuming that your functions are smooth and supported inside the closure, then uh, you have uh, injectivity. In other words, if you have a convex domain, you're sitting on a small piece of its boundary, and you're measuring the integrals along spheres centered on that small piece, and you register only zeros, then your function was zero. And again, this result is uh, in Rn. It's not just for 2D. Uh, but you are assuming that the functions are compactly supported. In fact, they have to be supported inside. And uh, the good thing about this is also that you don't have, as opposed to the previous case, you have to have the point all over at every point of the boundary. Here you can take any small piece of the boundary and that should be sufficient. Okay. So, um, by the way, I wanted to say, I don't know if I told you, but this paper was how I got into this field. <coughs> So, so my advisor said, why don't you read this paper? I think there is some good stuff there. And I read that, and that's how I got to the tomography. So I'll be talking about this paper a lot. OK, so um, now uh, some remarks, and then I'll show you some additional results in this field. So uh, just to keep things simpler, if you see an index S, that means that the centers are limited to that uh, set S. So RSFTR means it's the right circular random transform with, with centers limited to this surface or curve S. Um, another important comment, that the fact whether RSF is zero or not does not change if you take your F and convolve it with smooth mollifiers. So I know that uh, at some point of the talk, uh, somebody always asks, so how much smoothness do you require for F? Uh, a, lot, you know, a lot of 
happy for us there. You talk about support, support it inside, outside, contact it, not contact it, but you never talk about the, the degree of smoothness. But the, for the sake of this trauma, for the injectivity, the smoothness does not matter. Because if it's not smooth, convolve it with your favorite mollifier, okay? C infinity, nothing changes. Right? So the smoothness is not an issue in this business. The other thing is that you have those things with MQ, so that's MQ, that's okay. Yeah. That's just Infinity. Exactly, it's, the, it's uh, the, 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 the decaying speed rather than the smoothness issue. Okay, so uh, also, if now, if we are talking, th th these two things are kind of separate. Now, if you concentrate your attention only to the class of compactly supported functions, right? Fast decay doesn't work here, but if you concentrate your attention only to compactly supported functions, then it is no. That the, that the bad sets should be part of algebraic sets. If you limit your attention only to compactly supported functions and you're trying to classify good or bad things, you can assume, you can take for granted the fact that the bad sets have to be algebraic or part of algebraic subsets. So if, as soon as it's not algebraic, that's it, it's a good set. Okay, so you will see later that I'll say, well, algebraic variety, this, that. I, I'm not losing any generality as long as I stay within the class of compactly supported functions. Uh, and also it is known that algebraic surfaces of codimension higher than one are automatically non-injectivity sets. That part of the uh, theorem that was saying codimension two or higher, you can always do that. So if, if you throw in algebraic sets of codimension two or higher, uh, those are bad by themselves. Now, it's not so trivial to combine them with hypersurfaces. By themselves, they're that. Whether you can combine them with something, uh, 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 the codimension one is a different question. So, when you give it any algebraic surface, you can find some function, you can construct it with a specific construction. Um, it, it's, it's, it's complicated, it's not easy, but it's, but it's not. If, you, if you're given an algebraic surface of co-dimension two or higher, one can explicitly construct the. Uh, okay, so now what are, what are we going to do? Uh, of course, ideally we would like to in higher dimensions and or in case when the function is not compactly supported to give a full result. In other words, necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be good or bad. But that's uh, too ambitious, and so if we can. Uh, narrow in on this result uh, about, you know, as much as we can narrow it will still be good. So what we are going to do is try to exclude as many as possible pairs uh, where S is an algebraic surface and F is non-zero uh, uh, for the situation to be bad. Okay, so we are trying to, we're trying to get as many necessary or sufficient conditions for a set to be a, a, a bad set. So here's what we are going to do. Uh, we're going to, the, the next result is, is requires some, some notation. So this is the, the description of that result, of uh, those notations. So assume that S is an algebraic hypersurface. Define that. Say again. Define that. So basically, zero set of. Not the right function, sorry. So, for example, if you're in R2, let's say, I don't know, x, y is equal to zero, right? You have, the set would be, this would be a good example for us to consider. So, x times y is equal to zero, you have x is equal to zero, y is equal to zero, so you'll have the zero set would be the x axis and the y axis, right? So, uh, what I want to do is I want to, de to define distances uh, in, a, in, a, in a slightly uh, different way than, you know, not the usual Euclidean distances. So if you have this algebraic hypersurface, that algebraic hypersurface is going to split your space to parts. So for example, uh, if, if you have something like this, this would be your H, where do I put the index? At the top or at the bottom? At the top. So this would be H1, this would be H2. Okay. And now I'm trying to define a distance between two points in each of these uh, parts that I have split. And the distance would be the smallest length joining, uh, the, the length of the curve, the smallest length uh, joining two points without you leaving the boundaries of the uh, domain. Okay, so for example, 
if this is T and this is Q, uh, I want to de uh, define this D2PQ. The D2PQ would be, you would have to come up with a curve that joins these two points, but it does not leave H2, and you measure that length. Okay, so this distance means that you're staying within Hj, and you're taking the smallest possible length of all the curves joining these two points. And you want these curves to be C1 curves. Okay, so with that notation, uh, this is uh, a very hard to read uh, uh, result, but I'll try to walk through this and make sure that we understand what it says, and then from there we'll go to a bunch of uh, uh, simple to uh, swallow consequences, which uh, I, I think are going to uh, show the importance of this result. So assume that S is such a hypersurface. Again, these are going to be, uh, this is uh, supposedly the bad set, right? This is the, supposedly the non-injectivity set. And my function is defined, so let's say my function is defined in the plane, S is the non-injectivity set. What that means is I'm sitting here. I'm measuring integrals like this. All the integrals of that function defined in the plane are zero. And I'm trying to judge, some to say something about this S. OK, so here's what it says. If you have a function that is continuous, uh, and all R, S, F are zero, so you're sitting at the points uh, of S, and you are not seeing anything. Then here, here are the conclusions that you can make. Take a point x in uh, one of these parts. Let's say this is point x. And then I want to see how is this s related to the support of my function. So let's say this, I'm going to make some picture here. Let's say this is the support of f. Then the theorem says the following thing, that basically, let me tell you the, the meaning of this geometrically, and then we can read the algebra. It says that if you're sitting at some point here, then you should be able to see the support of the function directly. Right? And imagine, think of this being an obstacle. Think of that surface as being an obstacle. And this is your observation point, and you're trying to see the support of the function. So it says that you have to be able to see the support of the function directly. For example, uh, if the support, so for, this would be bad. This, this would be prohibited. You cannot have a situation like this because from here, you don't see the support directly. If you, you, know, if you, if you look, you, this, this uh, S gets on your way. The obstacle gets on your way. The support has to be stretching so far that you have to be able to see the support directly. Part of the support of the function. At least, at, at, you have to be able to see at least one piece of the support directly. Okay, so what it says is, let's read this. This is saying that, so support F intersected with HJ. So let's say I'm in H, what is it, H2, right? So the, di <coughs> the distance from X to the support of F inside H2, this is the Euclidean distance. Sorry, let's go here. The Euclidean distance from X to the support of F in H2 should be the same thing as the Kirby distance. And the only way the Kirby distance is the same as the, the Euclidean distance is if you have a direct uh, eye contact with the support. That, that's a severe restriction. And that has to happen at every point. So basically, no matter what point you take, in H2, from that point you have to be able to see the uh, support directly. That is putting severe geometric restrictions on the shape of your S versus support of the function. Okay? So let's say you fix your S. Then can you say something? So you're trying to say... That, it, you can look at it both ways. That's why I was saying we're trying to eliminate as many pairs as possible. If you fix S, that, that says a lot of what kind of F you may, or you, you may not have and what kind of F you may have. So you would say you want to... So if you fix S... That the kind of S you can recover, the S for which that will always be zero, you can have to have small support there, correct? Uh, uh, sm small is uh, not, the right not the right word, but it, it restricts the type of the support you may have. Or if you know F, then it tells you a lot of restrictions about the shape of S that that type of F may have. 
And you know, this is kind of a little bit abstract, but once I get to concrete examples of these corollaries, you may see how this thing plays out. And what this thing says is that if you are sitting there and you are looking at the Euclidean distance from that point to the support on the other side, that has to be larger. Okay, so, so if you are sitting here, the Euclidean distance to the support on the other side should be larger. Okay, that, that is a severe restriction. And the, the, in particular, what this means is that imagine what happens if your point X is sitting on S. If it's sitting on S, it's simultaneously in H1 bar, and it's simultaneously in H2 bar. And that means that this distances have to be the same. All of these things have to be the same. So if you are sitting on the boundary, the Euclidean distance to the support on one side should be equal to the Euclidean support on the other side, and that has to be equal to the curvilinear distance on both sides. So what that means is that from every point on S, you have to be able to observe the support directly. If you're sitting on S, the support should be visible directly. So what is impossible? For example, you cannot have, say, uh, something like this. If this is, the, this is the candidate for being su the support, this is impossible. Why? Because when you're sitting here, you don't see the support directly. Uh, uh, thinking of the curve being off. So what you're saying is that if you take your S here and centers on this, that the integral of function supported in that will not be zero. Exactly. And you see that it basically forces your S to be kind of straight, right? I mean, if, if your S is curvy, then the chances are that there is an obstacle for you to see some part of the support directly, and that forces, straightens your S. And that's not surprising if you think of the Agronovsky equator result, it all made, so made, is made out of lines. And you will see in a minute that I'll be showing some results where even in higher dimensions, it's a, it's a ruled surface. It's a surface made out of straight lines, and, and that all comes from this result that basically forces you to go uh, along this. So basically, the way the proof is, is the proof is very much based on your uh, techniques with this uh, uh, yeah, convex, if you think, and also this uh, finite speed of propagation and domain of dependence argument. Right? So on one hand, the signal cannot come. It has to go around because of the obstacle. On the other hand, it's an artificial thing, so, it has to, so these two things have to be the same. Okay, so let's see what kind of uh, what kind of outcomes do I get out of this. So one thing that in, that would imply the previous result that I showed with the piece of the boundary is the, the following thing: that if S is a relatively open piece of a C1 hypersurface and the support is on one side of the tangent plane, so let's say this is S. I don't know how it continues, but let's say you have a point. You take the tangent plane and the support of your function lies on one side of the tangent plane, even at one point, that's it. That, that's it means that your function has to be zero, identically. If you're sitting, if you're sitting here, and you're measuring, and you're not getting zero, and you know that your the support of the function cannot be on one side, then your function has to be identically zero. Why does this thing imply, uh, this thing follows, well, this is the general result. If you think of the uh, strictly convex case, that we mentioned. The strictly convex case means that the support of the function, because it has to be in the D bar, is sitting on one side, so you immediately get that. Right. right? So another corollary, the corollary is saying that if S is an algebraic hypersurface, remember for the compactly supported functions, saying algebraic hypersurface does not lose any generality, then if the RSF is equal to zero, every tangent plane has to intersect the convex hull of the support, right? Otherwise, your function is identically zero. If you want to have a function which is not identically zero, yet the spherical integrals are zero, you cannot have the support on one side of the tangent plane. What that means is that regardless of the point you take, the tangent plane has to intersect the convex hull of the support. Right? So again, this is, uh, we're building a bunch of severe restrictions uh, on S and F on the support of F and the shape of S. Here's another theorem. So now I'm going to R2, and I'll be considering algebraic curves. Well, for dimension one, an algebraic does not limit the generality because I'm in the compactly supported functions. So if you assume that RS is zero, 
but for some non-zero function f, then s cannot have any compact components, and the uh, and every component has to have asymptotes of infinity. Right. So. Um, So, for example, something like something like a circle would not be allowed. You cannot have something like a circle. You cannot have any compact or this is the same thing like the closed shape things, except that those have to be algebraic. And this is another. I mean, not that we didn't know this result before, but this is another way to see it. And the hope is that it may be generalizable to other cases. This is. Uh, Another condition, and under this condition, uh, we can claim uniqueness. So let me explain what this condition is. Again, it's, it's a lot of uh, words written here, but the condition says the following, that if you have a compact region in R, and again, you can think of the plane, and then we want to basically uh, restrict the curvature of the boundary. So what it says is that K satisfies condition A if there exists some number R0 so that at any point, so let me, So K can be K can be some, something like this. It can have holes in it, and it, because it's compact, then it has this infinite component, right? So now I'm, I want to take a point in the infinite component. So I don't want to have the complement. I don't want to be inside. I want to be outside of this compact thing. And now I want to come closer and closer to the boundary of K. And what I'm saying is that starting from a certain small number R zero. Uh, for all the radii, when you take circles centered at x at radius r, you're touching the boundary only once. At, uh, only once. So what you cannot have is you can have, not have a situation like this when you're sitting here at this x and you have a certain radius where you simultaneously touch both parts. Okay, condition A means that if you get close after a certain threshold distance, the closer you get, you always touch the boundary once. Okay. And that's a limitation on the curvature. For example, if your uh, domain is convex, that's immediately true. If your, con if your domain is C2, that's immediately true, and so on. So I'm limiting the, the, uh, the curvature of the boundary outside. So that's the examples. The convex set in C2, but it's more than that. Then here is a result. And I'm trying to get to, to Agronovsky and Quinto Pet result. What it says is, and, and this is through purely PDE means. Remember, the goal is to try to get Agronovsky quinto result without microlocal analysis, without zero apartment formulas, and so on. What this result says is, if you're in R2, you take this curve, algebraic hypersurface, you assume your function is not zero, but all the integrals are zero. If the external boundary of the support satisfies condition A, the one that I described, then the bad set has to be uh, like in Agronovsky quinto result, uh, a rigid motion of the Coxeter set and finite in many points. Okay, so if I fine tune it a little more, I can get basically, you, you see that if you add some extra conditions, you can all already use these techniques to get to the full strength of Agronovsky quinto result. So this is in R2. In R2, the situation is nice. In Rn, the same theorem holds, except we don't quite get the Agronovsky quinto result. The conclusion that we can make is that S has to be a ruled surface. In order to go from ruled surfaces to full strength of Agronovsky quinto result, I'm missing only one thing, that's the homogeneity. If I could only force ruled surface or a scroll is a surface that is made out of straight lines. A plane is a ruled surface. A cone is a ruled surface. Uh, but also, the hyperboloid, the saddle, is a root surface. So the, the good ones for us are the ones that pass through one point, and that is the homogeneity condition. And what I what we cannot claim yet is uh, the fact that it's uh, it's it's a cone, the fact that it has uh, that is a zero set of a homogeneous harmonic polynomial. So if we were to show that all the lines pass through the same point, then we would have the conjecture in R n because there is no result in our full result. But we're just missing one small thing. Of course, under some restriction on the support, on the, on the boundary of the support. Um, there are, we tried to work with some algebraic geometers uh, 
on this thing. They, 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 there is a lot of results about root surfaces. Uh, apparently, they are very, very uh, special, and you know, uh, we're trying to see if we can uh, squeeze this all the way, but uh, somehow we haven't been successful so far. Okay, so uh, there are some other results about the uniqueness. Again, I have, not, I have not been talking about inversion formula so far. I've already been talking about injectivity. When do you expect to have inversion? There are some other results, but the, as I said, the full strength result is still open for higher dimensions and also for a uh, situation where it's not compactly supported but touch the um, I, I don't think I will go any further about this. I, tomorrow I may address a little bit the situation when you don't have restriction or you have some restriction on the location but you also have restriction for the radii. When you have restriction on the radii, when you don't have, when you don't have all the radii available, the situation immediately changes. And also, uh, tomorrow I'll talk about inversion formulas, exact recovery, uh, exact reconstruction formulas. Not just qualitatively that you can do it, but the answer to the question how to do it. Also here.